part of the Dwarf Fortress Let's Play. It's going to be the first part in a series of tutorials about how to get and play Dwarf Fortress. In this first segment, I'm going to show you how to actually get the game and to uh, begin setting up all of your various things that you need to do in order to actually play it. Uh, by the way, the reason I haven't been doing very much Dwarf Fortress stuff recently is due to this awesome game right here, Unreal World. Uh, it's only three bucks, and I gotta say, as far as uh, dollar value goes, it's probably one of the, the best games that I've ever played. And uh, I'm considering about doing a Let's Play of that as well. Uh, but for now, let's go ahead and get started here. Uh, right here, I got iGoogle opened up. I'm gonna go ahead and type in Dwarf Fortress. Oops, if I can spell it. Lazy New Pack. And even you have to type it all in. So then you'd go down here, click this link. It'll bring you to this forum thread, and uh, you're going to actually have a newer version of the game than I have, because mine is like 0.19, I'm really far behind, and uh, I still don't know if I can even actually update it yet, because again, I don't know everything about Dwarf Fortress, I know a fraction of everything about Dwarf Fortress, uh, so I do know enough to get you started, so go ahead and go here and you click this button. This tells you all the stuff that's in the current package, and it tells you some other useless nonsense. And at the very top is the link back to the form thread, and right here you click download now, and then save the file. Um, and it is .zip, but I'm not going to actually do that. You do that. Uh, and once you get it, you should open it up and see, basically, if I have it on my desktop somewhere, this thing right here. Uh, folder that says late new pack and it won't say I'm actually at point one eight. Wow, I'm way far behind. Uh, and then you click it and it should have like a little folder like this. You want to go ahead and right click this icon here, late new pack.exe, create a shortcut, drag that shortcut over to your desktop and drop it there so you can get into Dwarf Fortress easily because you will not, you will not be like ever launching from the actual Dwarf Fortress utility which is in this folder. Uh, right here, you'll be wanting to launch the latest new pack. So, you open up the latest new pack, and it gives you this little graphical user interface. And this is how you adjust everything in the game. You can see the settings that I have right now when I was just kind of idling through continuing the fortress in the last video. I've had economy off, temperature off, weather off. Oh, and by the way, this has actually um, been the reason for um, the river acting all 3D. It has to do with blowing from the south, and then I stopped the weather and temperature in the winter, and it froze. Uh, but in any case, uh, you have all these settings to toy around with. Basically, what you're going to want to start out with uh, for your first time is economy, no. Invaders, yes. Temperature, yes. Liquid depth, probably no. I've, I've never played with liquid depth. I think it's probably dangerous to play with liquid depth. Uh, weather, yes. Uh, population cap, 200. Although, in my game, it's way over 200 at this point, uh, so I don't know exactly what this is even for. It hasn't stopped any populations far as I know. Cave-ins, yes, and then leave that alone. You want your aquifers off every single time, unless you're planning to play with aquifers. But I never, I would not want to play with aquifers ever. They're evil. Uh, and you can see in the little tooltip there, it says, oh, they just output infinite water and flood your entire fort. Yeah, that's one bad part of aquifers, but most of the time, they're right at the very top, they're on the surface level, or not the actual surface level, they're like two levels below the surface. And so you're never going to be able to get to any stone and can't build a fort or go below them without using very complex mechanisms to do so. Uh, but yeah, don't have aquifers on. Exotic animals, why not? It doesn't make any, uh, any difference to me what kind of animals I got in the game. Uh, leave the bottom start stuff alone. Go to your graphic settings. You can pick any of the graphics packs here. Uh, they're on newer versions than the ones here. This is still 0.18. Uh, but Iron Hand is the one I use in my Let's Play. It's kind of got square walls, and uh, like the dwarves kind of look like actual dwarves. The Mayday Pack has like hexagonal kind of walls, um, and kind of like uh, I don't want to say anime style dwarves, but it kind of reminds me of anime style dwarves. Uh, and then I don't. I've never done the Phobus, Phoebus, but I think it has a lot of the same stuff from Mayday, uh, so, yeah. 
Uh, you can also get different graphics packs uh, if you go to your graphics folder and import it from the forums, but I don't really do that ever. I, I use Iron Hand, so. And then Default ASCII is the what the vanilla version of the game looks like, and it's, uh, I mean, I've played it in vanilla before, but I would not say it's advisable, especially to people who are new at the game. Um, you're probably going to want to stick with a graphics pack. It's already incredibly complex. Trying to read between the lines of thousands of ASCII characters is, uh, is not an easy thing to do. Uh, so then you go ahead and click on your preferred graphics pack, click install graphics. You don't have to update your save games because you have not had any save games yet. Um, and then go to your utilities. Your therapist is probably your best friend. You're going to be using this a lot. Um, I don't ever use any of these other utilities, um, but I imagine they do what they kind of describe, like attach test. No idea what that does, actually. Clean map. That's relatively simple. I bet that probably cleans the map. Uh, so yeah, this is actual utility that starts the game. You can start Dwarf Fortress from there, but I don't think it actually runs with any of the, uh, settings in Lazy New Pack unless you click Lazy Dwarf Fortress. Uh, then you can go to Advanced. Um, all these options are pretty self-explanatory. There is an intro movie. I've never showcased it in, um, in my Let's Plays. Uh, but, it's like a short little startup thing, pretty cool, I guess, for your first time. I prefer to not have it because it's really loud. Uh, windowed mode, I always use windowed mode because uh, when I record, I generally, or not when I record, when I play, I generally have Dwarf Fortress running, but I don't always look at it because your Fortress can, it's pretty self-sufficient. You don't have to constantly look at it. Um, then this right here just tells you how much of your processor that Dwarf Fortress is allowed to use. You can set it to lower, higher, normal. I have it on normal. It doesn't matter to me really that much, but I do do other stuff while I'm playing Dwarf Fortress, so I don't want to give it too much uh, capacity there. This stuff feels your FPS. You can display it, your calculation FPS tab. Don't know what that is, and don't know what that is. I assume that's the one that tells you, like, when you make an action in the game, um, that's how fast it refreshes, and this one is how fast the screen refreshes for you to see. Um, but, yeah. Uh, this stuff down here, autosave, normally this is on by default, and this will, um, every season, it will, uh, every season change, that is, it will save your game, uh, so you don't have to exit to the main menu, uh, but I don't ever, um, interesting, I don't ever, um, use that, because autosave slows your game down, it's kind of like, if you play to E3, like, end of the year, autosave, uh, which I am not a fan of, I, don't have too many crashes with Dwarf Fortress, um, unless I'm screwing around uh, and I kind of expect a crash, so in that case I'll have saved anyways. Uh, you can turn on an initial save, that's exactly what it says there in the tooltip. As soon as you embark to the map, it saves it, um, which if I had had that on during the first video of the Let's Play, I would not have had to embark with a different group a uh, second time around, uh, but from your perspective, there was no difference there. That might be important to you. Uh, Usually you don't deal with a crash once you start, so whatever. Compress saves. Um, I guess that just means it compresses the file, not taking as, as much space, which might take longer to save. Not really sure. Auto save pause. That's um, whenever the season changes, there's quite a bit of lag spike when the auto save happens, but the game still runs unless you have the pause on. Uh, pause on load. That's like as soon as you start the game from the main menu, your game will be stopped. Uh, I highly recommend that because you don't want to start in and, like, be immediately doing stuff, especially if you quit, like, in the middle of a battle or something. Um, auto backup. I guess that backs up the save file somewhere else. I'm not really sure. I've never used that setting. So that's the main part of the Lazy New Pack here. You need this if you want to play Dwarf Fortress. I, I don't care if you think you're hardcore or not or whatever. Get the Lazy New Pack because it's much easier, much better than just getting the straight up Dwarf Fortress file and starting the game. Because uh, Dwarf Fortress is a great game, but it's much better if you can uh, if you can amplify the experience and manage it more easily by using these kind of utilities like the Lazy New Pack. Alright, so let's go ahead and uh, click Play Dwarf Fortress. And it does always start with this loud music playing. To my knowledge, there's no way to stop that. Um, and what we're going to do here, since this is a um, like tutorial thing, I'm going to do creating a new world. 
but I'm not going to click the create a new world thingy like the button there. I want to go to design a new world with advanced parameters. So you hit enter. Oh, and by the way, you move up and down in that menu with your arrow keys. You hit enter to select an option. This explains stuff about Gore Fortress, blah, blah, blah. Um, and with the latest new pack, you get this handy dandy world right here called the latest new world. And if you're playing the game for the first, the very first time, I would highly recommend that you use this world, uh, because you're just going to be able to, uh, not have to experience a lot of more dangerous aspects that come with regular worlds. Uh, so you can just go ahead and pick that one. And that's the reason I want to design a world with advanced parameters. There's actually a lot more stuff in there. Uh, but you can see here, this world has been generated and there's lots of different sections to it. There is on the bottom some kind of like uh, step, it looks like. Um, the world is named the Icy Continent. There are lots of different little biomes here. Uh, there's a volcano island, it looks like, over there. And some land volcanoes, and there's rivers, and lakes, and mountains. Um, to explain to you what these symbols mean, an inn is a hill. This little shrubbery nonsense is uh, like a grassland. This is also a grassland, but they vary depending on like the actual contents of it. Uh, a V, I think that is woods. It'll tell you what kind of stuff it is once you're actually uh, embarking. But this is just to give you an overall idea of the world map. This will not allow you to embark yet. It will just create the world uh, for your play. Um, and Blaze New Pack has all kinds of the different sort of biomes you're going to usually see, except there's no evil biomes, and there's no, like, extremely hard to survive uh, areas in the map. There's all relatively easy stuff, like you got ice, and you got the forest, and you got the mountains, and all that, so you still have a pretty good pick of your different types of stuff. Whenever you generate a world, it is completely randomly generated, except I think um, there are, as this design a world with advanced parameters might suggest, there are definitely settings that you can change, and thus there are settings that uh, have limits, so there are things that are um, kind of inevitable, like you're going to see uh, different types of biomes, but those biomes are probably going to be closer to each other. Like, you're not going to see, um, like, a huge mountain range right next to, uh, well, I guess that's a bad example. You're probably not going to see an icy step in the middle of the world, because the temperature around the equator of the planet is going to be warmer than at the poles, uh, which is why the ice is on the top and ice is on the bottom. Uh, but yeah, that's just the world over here. On the left, you see some stuff, um, how it's preparing. This is all happens while it's creating the world, this whole section here. This explains the world. Uh, it's year 50, and that's just because the latest new pack defaults to year 50. You can change the setting uh, along with some other settings if you want to. It gives you an age of the world. Apparently, it's the age of the Bronze Colossus, which means there is like a mega beast out here, a Bronze, bronze Colossus specifically, that's been rampaging through the wild and killing people naming, what have you, which is why it's named for him. The historical figures, that tells you, like, the important people, like, there are a lot more than just 380 people in the world, but that tells you how many are of note. Uh, dead people, 236, uh, events, uh, this is random crap that's, like, battles and, uh, artifacts and foundation of civilization, stuff like that, uh, gets cataloged here. So, Hit enter to accept that. Then you can click start playing. And uh, that world was region 12. It was in the Ramul region 12. You can see there's another one there. This is one of my continuous ones I usually do with Venture Mode. It's the last all spots, which is a very icy kind of uh, climate as a whole. It's pretty neat. But let's go ahead and enter here. You get three options when you pick a, uh, a world. You have the option to go to Dwarf Fortress mode, Adventurer mode, or Legends mode. Dwarf Fortress mode is what you've seen in my Let's Play. It's uh, where you control a fortress, you control a civilization, well not a civilization, you control a settlement, generally, uh, and all the dwarves that are in that settlement, but you don't control them directly. You control them through borders, you control them uh, just by general management. In Adventurer mode, you take control of one character, uh, not necessarily a dwarf, you get options between the different races. Uh, and you kind of go around and do quests and fight and stuff. Adventure mode is pretty cool. I might do adventure mode let's play later on, but then 
the last one, Legends, is the one we're going to look at right now. This explains kind of the history of the uh, the world that you're you're in, and it tells you kind of the important stuff that's happened and everything. So let's take a look at the civilizations and other entities. In this world, there are ten surviving civilizations. Looks like, I think uh, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one. Yeah, there's ten. Um, and on the right there, you can see what their symbol is. Uh, and that's that'll appear on the map uh, once you go there. Uh, but you can see we have Yuxim Eben, Work of Clobbering, uh, Murky Gills, Dreamy Confederacy. Let's take a look at the Dreamy Confederacy. The Dreamy Confederacy was a human civilization of the legendary plane. Uh, and it explains all of this random stuff that affects the whole civilization. Um, but I think that the civilization is still around. Uh, is not going to be having too many epic things happen. Yeah, it's just talking about who their enemies are and like who their friends are and stuff like that. So that'll explain the history of all the civilizations. And that their symbol is a bow and arrow. So let's take a look at the historical map. This is of the world um, that we generated. This is going to show us kind of like what the civilizations are up to in this time. Uh, and we can advance time with the numpad keys of plus and minus. Let's go ahead and advance time a little bit. We're looking for the bow and arrow. Right now, it looks like there are no bow and arrows yet. I'm guessing these guys are a dwarven civilization to work with Bobbery because they're over by a mountain biome. They got a dwarf. These guys are probably humans because they got the little well and they're in the central plains. Now, uh, here's our dreaming confederacy along the coastline here. Um, and then up here there's a goblin one, and down here it looks like there's like probably another goblin one. Um, but let's increase time. At first, civilizations just kind of go out and uh, expand freely, but you can see already there's a little bit of conflict here because there's claimed territory that the comedic swamps and the work of clobbering are, are vying over. And that's because it's blinking, which means that these civilizations have gone to war with each other. And thus, if you are playing in fortress mode, if you're, if you're an adventurer, um, if you're a member of one civilization, then you will be at war with that other civilization. So if I was a member of the work of clobbering, and I embarked to right here, then humans that came from the comedic swamps would be hostile to me. They would be at war with my civilization. And thus, I would have to deal with things like sieges. Uh, but let's continue. By year 30, we have like a massive invasion of the Dreamy Confederacy by Stro Stroko Trongus. This is another civilization. And it looks like the Dreamy Confederacy is getting completely annihilated. They're also getting invaded by the humans over here. Um, and it looks like this front is pretty stable with kind of a stalemate between work clobbering and the community swamps. Uh, up here, the civilization, the goblin one, just completely alone, not at war with anybody, it looks like, anyways, and they are, um, they're peaceful, uh, so far as we can tell. Advanced time more, it looks like the Dreaming Confederacy is getting whipped even harder by, uh, Swoko Trongus, um, and it looks like the work of clobbering is starting to advance into, uh, the comedic swamps territory, and the disloyalty of Mark as perhaps it looks like maybe expanded a little bit in a dream confederacy territory. Uh, and then year 50, that's the current date, that's the year the world was Gen 2. Uh, so at this point, once you play the game, the years will start to count down and the history will be developed in your gameplay. Uh, but the prehistory of the game has shown us that basically the dreamy confederacy is on the run from being just completely whipped by the comedic swamps and Sroko Trongus. Uh, that this goblin civilization up here is kind of moderately powerful, but still relatively peaceful because they haven't really encountered too many people. Uh, that might have to do with the fact they're surviving in a primarily steppe and icy character. Uh, and then in the middle here, you got the comedic swamps who are now kind of being squashed between, uh, the work of clobbering who have just been massively expanding and, uh, the dreaming confederacy who are trying to, like, survive, uh, basically. So, at this point in the game, it looks like the two superpowers are basically Sroko Trongus and the Work of Clobbering. So the dwarves, and I'm guessing these guys are goblins, um, are the ones who are extremely powerful. And if you're doing adventure mode, then you probably want to pick one of those civilizations because they're going to have the 
most settlements and therefore the most quests for you to do. Uh, but you can obviously, you know, go ahead and make the civilization still find a lot to do. I mean, there's always stuff to do with more players. Uh, but then this gives you an idea if you want to do kind of a more political uh, playthrough in Fortress mode of where you want to deploy. So if you wanted to be at war with goblins and have fights with lots of goblins, then you should probably build your settlements right up here next to uh, goblin territory or in goblin territory, uh, because that will, number one, make them have to fight you, but number two, uh, that will give your civilization an advantage in that region, a stake in that region. And I think since these are the only dwarves in the map, as far as I know, the work of clobbering would have to be the civilization I choose. I don't know, we'll see in a minute. Um, but yeah, that's so far how that's developed. Up here you can see historic figures that list all of the important people. Um, starting off with Forgotten Beasts, going down, starting to get into dwarves, goblins, males, or not even males, elves, humans. Uh, and that goes through everything. I mean, all people who are important enough to gain their own, like, name are going to be in that list. Um, so, and if you're, you have a fortress in a region already, you can go through here and find all of your dwarves. And you can see some people have died, like immediately, like this person, this male human, born in 48, died in 49, so he's a baby, he got killed. Human born in 48, he was the youngest son of Ros McClutch Tane, and Tuck Clutch Tone, and Kip Head Stacker of Dawn. In the mid-spring of 49, the Minotaur, Meli Clubbered Sculpture, the Brave, attacked Eddie. Uh, in the mid-spring, Eddie was struck down by the Minotaur, and as a result, he died. So, um, it says who they're related to, um, and it says the, like, the civilization, the organization that they're related to. So this guy is a member of the Dreaming Confederacy, uh, so he's part of that human civilization. He's also a member of the Council of Enchanters, which I believe is a, uh, like, a group, uh, which you can pick once you go into Fortress Moon, uh, but would be part of that civilization. Um... There's regions of the world, there's lots of different places, uh, like there's one place in, um, in my let's play that you continually refer to, like the plans of some type of whatever, there's lots of constant battles, and same thing here, it'll tell you all the regions that have gained names and then have had stuff happen to them as such. Um, this tells you about how the, the Jabber, folks have Max Grouse settled in blah blah blah, so that just tells you kind of what's going on in regions, underground regions, that's the same thing as regions, but it deals with, like, caverns, fortresses, that type of stuff, civilizations we've been through, and this is completely, like, everything that's happened, every single event, in chronological order, um, that's happened in this game so far, or in this world, and apparently the most recent thing that's happened in 50, the elf, female, smile lizards became the druid of the comedic swamps, okay, so apparently the comedic swamps groups are a elf civilization. So that's what that's all it is. It just kind of catalogs information for your viewing and for your um, kind of informed decision making as to what kind of mode you're going to play in and what kind of uh, game you want to have. What, whether you want to fight this type of enemy or if you want to be peaceful and deploy some type of variant, whatever. So that'll tell you what you need to know. Um, so I expect to be in this world again. And um, I'm going to be showcasing how to play Fortress mode. I'm not going to go through adventure mode in this at all. Uh, so hit enter on your fortress. I'm going to pick this and finally have music goes away. Uh, and now we are brought to the world map, the embark screen particularly. And there's three different maps that will show you. You have the local right here. This is going to be the one that your fortress is deployed to. This little area right here is where my fortress would be. And I believe we start directly in the center of this flight zone. The one over here is the region map mode. That's the one that, like, um... Each region consists of all of this space right here that's in that local map. Um, so if you wanted, you could, but you almost undoubtedly, unless you had like a supercomputer, crash your game, uh, you could deploy and do that whole region. Uh, but just for a frame of reference, the massive region that my fortress is in is only like... Oops, a second. Oops. Is only like... Um, like this big, maybe a little bit, a little bit smaller than that. So you can see how obviously um, huge that a single 
a region is, and as a result, how huge a world is. Because again, a world in Dwarf Fortress is just that. It's not like just a small little region of a map or whatever. It's the entire world. Um, and so if you just, if you generate a large world, and at least New Peck is a small world, I believe, uh, then you have got just absolutely tons of regions to pick through. Um, but let's go ahead and take a look at some of the biomes. Up at the top here, you obviously see on the world map, there's ice. On the region map, it's slightly larger. And then if on the local map, you'll see that this entire area is probably composed of ice. Um, so as a result, you will not want to deploy there unless you're looking for something incredibly challenging. Um, but generally, what you want to find is a, uh, a region that's in between civilization that has nice uh, kind of surrounding lands and uh, maybe a volcano because volcanoes are always pretty awesome. You can get magma really easily by having a volcano. Uh, but let's go ahead and take the example of if I wanted to be fighting the dreamy, the dreamy uh, something brothers, I can't remember their name, and uh, strong or whatever they're called, then I could go right here. And I could actually check that if it tab um, and says the neighbors that I'd have would be elves who are from uh, the dreamy whatever, right? Or maybe those are actually the guys at the bottom. Um, and then goblins who are not, they don't have any relations with the dwarven civilization. There are no dwarves or humans here um, because those are only, the only two civilizations here are the dreamy whatevers and then the shrubbalabalabal guys. So these are the only guys down here. And as I believe the only dwarven civilization is the uh, uh, the one over here. What do they call the work of clobbering? Yeah. Um, then yeah, that the only civilization in this whole world is the work of clobbering. You can pick. Uh, generally, there's like four or five dwarven civilizations. Um, but the the work of clobbering has not even established relations with the the guys down here in Shrunk, blah, 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 uh, and they are at war with the, uh, the elves from Dreamy, whatever they're called. Um, so deploying here, you would immediately find yourself in conflict with elves and probably with goblins over time. You would not necessarily have contact with humans or dwarves, but they are available. Um, the only dwarves you'd ever see are going to be from your home civilization in this part. Humans, they might send a caravan, but there's not going to be a strong human presence in the region because that's simply not how the civilization worked out. If I went like all the way um, where to I guess that maybe the, the primary composition of this world is elves and there aren't really that many human civilizations. Uh, and the dreamy civilization or whatever probably only has humans here. I'm not really sure how that works out. But again, because our civilization is a piece of uh, with the humans, um, and has not established relations with the goblins, um, then you're pretty much open to do what you want, except you're going to be at war with the elves, no matter where you go. But if you want to actually have contact with their civilizations, you need to deploy somewhere that's kind of in battle. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of how the civilizations thing work. You get a tab to switch your modes around, that's what this thing in the top right is. And I'm going kind of scatterbrained through this, but I should explain everything. Um, but back to the main indicator here, which is the one that explains the climate and the biome of the region that you're in. Um, let's pick... Uh, let's pick this area right here, because there's a river, and you almost always want to have a river somewhere around where you're deploying, because rivers are... Um, Rivers are important for getting water, they're important for having, uh, power, they're important for keeping enemies necessarily from being able to easily reach you, uh, so rivers are important to have. And as a result, I'll deploy right here. I shrunk the deployment zone to a 3x3, three three, and you can do that by, uh, holding down shift and using the U and M keys to grow and shrink, respectively, your uh, deployment zone. You can also uh, grow and shrink the horizontal deployment using H and K. 
Uh, and so we look at this region here. It is a tropical savanna biome. It has a temperature of warm. There are sparse trees, uh, which is fine. I mean, you don't need too many trees. Like the region I deployed in on my last play has absolutely tons of trees, and I'll never ever use all of them. Uh, other vegetation, moderate. I generally like to keep vegetation pretty low because it's very cluttering and it just is a very active map that you see when you have lots of vegetation. Uh, and then the surroundings are calm. This indicates that there's not really any strong evil presence nearby. It does not, however, mean that you're not going to have to deal with uh, elves, goblins, and everything else that might try to invade you or whatever. It tells you the streams or rivers or whatever sources of water that you have uh, right here. In this case, we have Bristle Dine, the brightness of brightnesses of sneaking. Um, that's a stream, which means it's very small. I think a stream is actually smaller than a brook, uh, and a brook is smaller than a river, and then uh, the rivers are smaller than like lakes and oceans and stuff. So uh, then we see right here it shows rocks. We've got primarily a low and sand uh, deployment area, which I would not advise ever to deploy in an area but pri primarily composed of these materials um, right off the bat. Because while you are only going to see really uh, the loam and sand at the top layer, uh, it's important to have stone early on. But we do have phyllite, gabbro, rock salt, so we're good on that front. Uh, at the very bottom, you see here F1 and F2 show the biomes. Hit F1, we can see the first biome is that tropical savanna. F2, there's a temperate grassland on the northern part here. Uh, all this blinking area is temperate black grassland. And the only differences are uh, apparently going to be in the vegetation because they have the same temperature, same number of trees, and all that. Uh, so there's not too, too much of a big difference there. So we'll take a look at some of the other tabs conditional things. Hit tab here, seeing the neighbors, seeing the civilization. Uh, this is relative elevation. This basically says that um, given this local area, what's really high and what's really low and what's about average. It looks like this area here is about average height. Uh, an extremely high area is going to be uh, grayer. So it looks like this is probably the lowest, and this is the higher areas here, and these are the medium ones. Uh, in our deployment zone, this little red area is where we're deploying. Uh, so that just shows you relative height. That's not that useful, really. Uh, the cliff indicator is moderately useful. This tells you uh, specifically the actual height of where you're at. Where it's completely flat, there's a coffin. So you can see here, there's completely flat all the way through that whole area there. Slopes are just small little sort of hills, um, and there aren't any in the deployment zone we're in. Very high cliffs are going to be this reddish color, and then it gives you numbers if it goes higher. And extreme cliffs are basically mountains. Very high cliffs are um, also this little asterisk sign. Uh, so if you have those in your region, you'll have plenty of stone, chances are. Uh, but I, I deployed basically to a really flat area here. Hit tab again, you go back to the main little node here. Hit in for notes. That's apparently, I guess, that's to tell you if you've used one world for a really long time and you want to keep track of where fortresses have been and where you did what. I guess you could use the notes feature. I've never used notes because I usually don't even use the same world when I deploy. I probably should. Consistency is entertaining. Uh, but yeah, once we've set up everything here, once you've picked out a good region to start and you're happy with all the settings here, and you're not too concerned about your surroundings, then you can go ahead and start. And you do that by pressing E to embark. Uh, at this point, you're given a screen that lets you choose your setup. Um, generally, what I'll do is go with one of these pre-made packs because it's simple, and as time goes on, you're gonna get dwarves for everything anyways. Um, my advice to you would be to pick uh, either this first one or take the lazy new pack because you always want to have two miners in my experience anyways one woodcutter uh, and then a, uh, a mason and then a couple of farmers craftsman or broker on the other hand you could have an extra fisherman that's if you're in an area with 
not necessarily uh, large amounts of land, but you do have a river. So that wouldn't be a too bad of a pick for the one brand. I don't really, I don't like fishing so much. Uh, so I just picked this layout. If you, if you really want to um, set up everything really carefully and do from scratch, you can prepare for the journey carefully. Uh, but using this, you still get to pick all those options and just preset a bunch of stuff for you. Uh, so I would, I would pick this one. Go ahead and hit enter. Ooh, that's a lot of stuff. Apparently our civilization has no dwarven wine, no cave wheat seeds, no anything. Not even any plump helmet spawn. I don't know how our civilization can live. I mean, we don't have farming materials at all. So as a result, we can see in the bottom right here, there's tons of points left over um, in the embark screen. Uh, and what's this P problem? Well, that just tells you what I could actually deploy with. Um, and so generally you're going to see a zero down here, or a very small number if you pick one of the deployment packs, because this just tells you um, like what you have to spend on your embark. And you can buy items with it, you can upgrade your quartz skills with it, um, but that just tells you what uh, what you have to work with, basically. So, because we're going to need to change some things, we go to the item screen, and wow, the only things that we've picked out so far are copper picks, copper battle axe, willow buckets, lens crutches, cow meat, iron anvil. We have no seeds, no farming implements whatsoever in this whole fortress, which is definitely a problem. Um, so to solve that problem, uh, we're going to have to buy some stuff. Let's take a look here first. Man, there are no materials like at all available. We can buy extra stuff, uh, but like we could buy extra pigs. But realistically, we don't have any way to uh, get more stuff. Apparently, a civilization only has these materials. This is all we get: picks, battle axe, iron anvil, buckets, flints, crutches, and counters. We don't have any way to get food in the long term. So what I'm going to do, because we don't have any way to farm, uh, at least right off the bat, I'm going to order up some animals. Specifically, I'll take uh, what's really cheap. We have kittens are cheap. No, thank you. Um, I guess actually I'll take a cow, a bull, and uh, Some dogs, and that will be lots of meat for the starting uh, starting setup. Uh, and as a result, we'll be able to get food for quite a while based on that. That does not solve the issue of alcohol, however, because that's going to be incredibly important for a while. Our dwarves are going to have to drink water, which is never a good thing. Go back to this screen. Uh, you can see here. It shows you a dwarf on the left, it gives you their job title, and then it shows you their skills. So, um, because it's a not one that I made, it's a preset pack, everyone starts out as a peasant. Usually they'll be called miners or whatever once you get in. Uh, but you can see what they are by going through their skills and see what they have once. Uh, so like this guy, I bet he's probably a farmer. I go through his skills. He is a competent grower and competent herbalist. That's nice. This other guy here, he, okay, we're looking for the other farmer among these people. Okay, yeah, this guy right here. He is going to have to be not a farmer. So we're going to take out all of his skill points that he had in um, threshing, growing, herbalism, all that stuff. Take all that out. And put those points into fishing and uh, stuff that gives us actual food for the time being. So we want to have fishermen and uh, fish dissector and fish cleaner. And that will be good for him. Uh, so we'll now have a source of food constantly, provided we can actually use that. Uh, 
uh, creek to fish. So uh, the other setup we have, all the other stuff still remains valid. One farmer, one new fisherman right here, I think. One mason, one woodcutter, one one broker or whatever, and then two miners. Uh, and we have some leftover points, so we'll spin that on male dogs. There. We have three points left. That's good enough. Uh, now that we have set up our actual embark items and dwarf skills, we can go about customizing a little bit. You can name your fortress or see what your fortress name means. And the dwarven language is all here. Like every word in the dwarven language has its dwarven word, its English meaning, and then its like word form. Um, so you can make anything you want here. Uh, our fortress would be named Folded Steel or Ost de Lair in dwarf language. That's a good enough name for me. You can also name your group. This is like the founding seven who they are going to be called. Um, and this is a subset of your civilization. This is kind of like the, the leadership of the fortress, what it's going to be known as. Uh, and this is apparently the Pillar of Whirling, or Obok Estif. I'm going to change that to the Immortality, Immortality in the Pillar of Whirling, uh, which changes it to Azoth Obok Estif, which is pretty awesome. So yeah, that's, uh, that's the name of our fortress. You can hit C and customize the other flag. Um, and see and customize and also activate the music. A dwarf's name and nickname. Uh, you can in to change their name, their first name, whatever you want. So we can name this guy Urist McNamey. Okay, and then you can name his profession. This guy will be named Namerson. So that'll show up. His professional name will show up if he's ever in combat. His nickname will show up pretty much everything else. So that shows you how to customize stuff. Um, and that's everything. That's everything we can do at this screen. Uh, except we can also view. We can check their stuff. Again, the music starts. Uh, but yeah, that's that's what we see here. Everything's done. Hit E to embark. And you have arrived after a journey from the mountain home to the forbidding wilderness beyond your heart strength has blah 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 blah. Uh, and um, that brings us to, whoa, the starting area. I'm going to turn this freaking music off. Same thing loud. There we go. Uh, and at this screen, this is what you'll see at startup. You have the three sections here. This is your main game screen. This is your menu screen. And this is the, uh, like, mini-map screen. First things first, you want to get rid of these two screens, or actually just this far right one. Uh, you do that by hitting tab, and then tab again to shrink the menu screen. Uh, while you're first starting out and playing this game, you're going to want to have this screen open a lot, because you want to get familiar with the letters that you have to press. Uh, and what they do. So, um, when you very first start off, the very first thing you want to do, you hit D for designation, T for chop down trees. Uh, and you can see on the right, everything that I'm hitting, it explains what all the key does. So you'll get familiar with that over time. Uh, and then you want to drag out a sphere by hitting enter to start it, and then dragging it out and hitting enter again. Uh, and that will select everything in that designation zone that can be designated for activity. So since I designated all trees in this zone for chopping down, all the trees right here that are kind of like grayed out with a black square around them have been uh, given the order to be cut down. Uh, the next thing you want to do is uh, probably change your key binding. To go here to hit escape to the main menu, uh, you hit key bindings. You want to go to General, general. Uh, then you want to go down to your move view cursor up and down, which are here. And oh wait, I need my is it two one? That should be move selector. Um, bear with me. Oh yeah, up and Z. This is what you want right here. You want to change these to more comfortable key 
cheese and then shift and then uh, the carrot symbols because you're going to be using up and down Z level a lot. Um, and the one I have changed them to is numpad 1 and 2 since I'm on a laptop. Numpad 1 and 2 are like one key away from my arrow keys, uh, which means I can very easily and quickly change Z levels uh, while I'm still moving around the map. Uh, again, you don't have to do this, but I would highly recommend it if you're going to be, uh, if you're not familiar or you don't like the whole time shift every time you change the level, uh, then do this. Um, and to change it, you scroll down to it with your, your uh, arrow keys over, you move over to it with your right arrow key, you scroll through here, uh, you want to add a binding, and then you hit in your, whatever key you're replacing it with. Uh, I did numpad 1 and 2. For me, numpad 1 is the key that goes up a Z level, as you can see right there. Um, and you want to, I'll do that again, I guess, again, for numpad 1. You want to pick by position, because otherwise, if you go by a letter and you hit, or if you select this option here, by a letter, that means if you hit 1 on the uh, like top row, the key row of your keyboard, that will also change it. Uh, so you want to do by position. Uh, and that means numpad 1 will now change up and down, or just change up a Z level. Uh, so that's good. And then uh, to get rid of it, you hit backspace. And I have to rebind it because I, I had that bound twice. So I'm going to numpad 1, by position numpad 1. And, and that is how you do a binding. Uh, then you connect back to the main screen. And you want to hit save and exit. I'm just going to discard changes. Um, and you'll see here again the main map. You can change down. You want to get to see where the very bottom floor of the map is for, for this map section we're on, very small one. It's, uh, it's this area here that's the bottom. Uh, it's pretty cool, really. I mean, you can see here how the river is kind of coming in from down there and then pouring down uh, through this section here of the map. And then also exiting from over here after making a nice bend around through the map. So if I was going to do this fortress long term, probably what I'd do is like set up across this whole area, maybe build a bridge across that river, and base the fortress around that. Uh, but there are security concerns at hand. Uh, in any case, after you've got your trees designated for chopping and you've got your key binding set up, uh, then you're ready to start actually uh, constructing the area around your fortress. So, um, I have a lost where we deployed to. You can jump back to something called the gate by hitting F1. Um, that'll bring you back to where you first embarked. Um, you can change that hotkey later by going into that setting, messing around with it. Uh, but at the very beginning, I just leave it be because that'll take you back to where your embark point was. As you can see here, Got a ton of dwarves just kind of standing around and uh, doing nothing. Uh, that's because the game's paused right now. Uh, if I unpause it right now, then we'll see our woodcutter, who is uh, our woodworker rather, Tobal bin Rigoth. He will run around and chop down some trees. Uh, then if we go to designate key again, we'll hit D. Uh, and we hit D again to select the mining category. We can go down to wherever we think there would be a good spot for a fortress. Uh, and in this case, I will pick, as the entrance of this tutorial sort of fortress, I will pick this little area here. And uh, for me, I generally base my fortresses on a design of odd numbers, because odd numbered hallways allow for a 3x3 three three staircase layout. And you will understand what that means as you play. Um, but let's see how many of these tiles as long as it. Uh, geometry is rather important to the way you set up your fortress. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, seven, good. That's a humongous entrance hallway. So I'm actually going to shrink that down uh, to five. Um, and the reason you want to pick that is because mainly due to two factors. Number one, you can hit D and uh, pick out a staircase level or whatever. You go three by three, you still have an edge to walk around. Uh, and that's important usually because your dwarves will be able to move much quicker through an area that they have more room to go around than somewhere where they have to kind of push and shove.
for each other to get through. Um, so the way this will work right now is my miners go here and start digging this out. Uh, and then once they get to this point, they dig up down staircases, which are in this section right here. Uh, and that would mean that they dig downwards, but they also uh, carve out up staircases, which allow me to go this direction. Um, but that's actually impossible given the layout of the land there. Uh, so instead what I do is I take hit J for downward staircase, enter to start designating, and then drag it over and make it down to the staircase. Uh, that would start putting us under the ground here. Um, so, that being done, we now have a small little area designated for taking out the fortress. Uh, and I'm not actually going to do that section. I'm not going to take that out because I don't think it's necessarily a good idea to uh, start going down yet. Um, and uh, we want to expand this. The very first stuff, the very first step is to actually completing uh, getting your fortress ready for habitation. I'll show you uh, in the next video around, but for this video, I think this has been an adequate uh, tutorial of how to get started in Dwarf Fortress, how to get Dwarf Fortress, how to uh, understand map generation, world generation, uh, and also how to do embarkation and begin your first steps of getting on the map. Uh, so with that, I can see you in the next episode where I'll be covering how to set up the first area in your fortress for living in